So we are in week four of the Holy Bible series. Um, don't you want to do me a favor and just turn to your neighbor, look them dead square in the eyes and just say, you look like you need some Holy Bible in your life. If you haven't been here the last couple of weeks or you're new to church or our church, welcome. It really is great to have you. Welcome to those online. Um, you can always catch any of the weeks on our YouTube and Facebook channels. Um, but we are in week four of the Holy Bible series and I've, I personally have loved it. There's been some incredible insights, uh, helpful tips. Um, and I thought I'd just share a couple of highlights uh, for me over the last three weeks before I jump into the message. One of the highlights for me, if you were here, I think it was in week one, Hilt was sharing, might have been week two, Hilt was sharing about taking the tea bag and dipping it into the hot water and how the substance on the inside changed. And it was just this aha moment where I sat here going like, man, that's, a, that's amazing. So the concept was, you gotta put the word of God on the inside of you and then it changes you, like supernaturally just changes you on the inside. And I started thinking back over the last 18 years and seeing the transformation in my life and how God's freed me and how God's set me up. And there's been a, an intimacy with God and a health in our family. And there's been a, 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 a passion about our purpose. And I thought, man, I wonder how much of that is purely down to for the last 18 years, just reading his Bible. Just like without, because sometimes we can think like we've got to make all these like intense changes and habits and if we do this, then that'll happen. I wonder if you and I would just commit to saying, God, over the next decade, every day, I'm just going to read your word and I'm going to watch what you do on the inside. I really, it is a holy Bible. It's a miraculous word and has supernatural ability to change us on the inside. The other thought that I love that Hilt mentioned was that when we read this word, when we read the Bible, uh, we are not looking for law, we're looking for the Lord. We are looking for Jesus. The texts, the scriptures are not there to give us a moral code, although they help us with that, but we are looking for Jesus in the scriptures. John chapter one speaks about the word was with God, uh, and in the beginning, the word was with God, and he was God, and, and so the point is, is that when we open the Bible, you actually get to see Jesus. Um, who was it? Let me see. Uh, I read a great quote from Martin Luther. He said this, the Bible is the cradle wherein Christ is laid. Isn't that a beautiful thought? The Bible is the cradle wherein Christ is laid. You get to look and run after and seek Jesus within the text. And then the third highlight for me uh, was just going back to basics around memory verses. Sunday school, learning your Bible, off by heart, we've done a whole bunch of memory verses. And I'll give you a story from our uh, family's life. Um, we pray every day on the way to school and um, Rory coming to join me on stage, just coming to move my mirror so it doesn't Shout out to Toko, thanks for your mirror from your bedroom. Uh, really grateful. It's not his mirror. Uh, it's my mom's mirror, so shout out to my mom. Um, didn't want to take Toko's mirror because he wouldn't let me. Um, so, but I love the idea of the scriptures and memorizing the scriptures. So we pray on the way up to school. I've got three kids, six, four, and two. And, um, and every morning we'll pray together. And my oldest daughter like her dad, tends to overthink, overworry, um, and sometimes overcomplicate life um, with her mind that works on overdrive. And so uh, it's not out of the ordinary for her to tell me, hey, I'm a bit nervous today, or I'm feeling anxious, or a bit worried about today. I feel like, you know, and then she'll kind of unpack that just a little. And then normally we'll, you know, and she knows this, we'll dive into a, hey, let's pray about that. And she's super willing and prays and asks for God's peace. But because we've been doing the Holy Bible series, I thought, well, hey, hold on. Let me give you a scripture, Emma, that will help you when you feel nervous. And so one of my favorite scriptures, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. So I'm like, well, that's a little complicated for a 6, 4, and 2-year-old. And so I say, hey, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, and uh, I give her the scripture reference because it's good to have friends. It's better to know where they live. <laughs> Some of you like the Bible says, yes, friend, but it's better to know where they live. You know you're a good friend with somebody when you've been to their house. 
you know, their street address. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, our teacher says that God did not make us afraid or does not make us afraid, but gives us, and then we do, you know, a whole bunch of actions because it helps power, love, and a good mind. Um, and so I then teach her that, hey, you know, when you feel afraid, you're not always going to have dad there, but you'll always have the word. You'll be able to swing that sword when you feel afraid, and you watch what it does in your heart. And so we've been doing this every day, and I took a little video just to encourage you and show off how cute my kids are. Um, but here it is on the screen. Check it out. Okay, guys, ready for your scripture this morning? Yeah. Okay, Emmy, you go first. What does the scripture say? 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, God has not made me afraid. He's given me power, love, Great job, Roman <laughs> Judah. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, God has not made me afraid. Power, love, and a good mind. Fantastic, <laughs> Roman Judah. Okay, Orlando Justice, you ready? Uh, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, God yes. has not made me afraid. Yeah, and I made you afraid, it's given you power, power love, love, and a good mind. Great <laughs> job, my boy. All right. We, we, we're working on the two-year-old, but, um, but it really is important to our family to honor the word, uphold the word, and... Uh, no diss on anyone here, but my six, four, and two-year-old might know more scripture than some of you this morning. And I want to encourage you that we really need to honor and value and uphold the Word of God. And over the last couple of weeks, Hilt's done an impeccable job of setting up this idea about the Holy Bible. He's given us great insight, evidence, perspective, understanding, proof, and persuasion. And so I'm going to and perhaps wrongly, but I'm going to assume, based off of the last three weeks, that you're in, that you're convinced, that you need no more convincing that this is a miraculous book, that this is a holy book, that this is a God-inspired, God-breathed book. And so we're going to look today about how do we live deeply devoted to this book. Because this holy Bible that we're speaking about, many people have given up their lives for this holy Bible. God uses the reference and speaks about it being something that he's literally breathed into existence. And I would argue that it's probably God's greatest gift to us on this side of eternity. So how do you and I hold in high regard and honor the word of God today? I'm gonna give you four R's that I think are going to be practical and helpful. But before I dive into those four R's, I want to put this statement up because I really believe this is important when it comes to your Bible. First, open your heart, then open your Bible. First, open your heart, then open your Bible. What that means for me is that I don't rush into my reading of my Bible because it's a religious duty. What I do is I take a moment, I close my eyes, I still the silence, I pray a prayer that goes something like this. God, I'm about to read your word. It's no ordinary book. These scriptures have the ability to transform me on the inside. I don't want to read it like a textbook or a religious duty. Jesus, I want to see you in the text. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to take this word and speak to me. I don't want to just read it. I want it to read me. And so before you open up your Bible, open up your heart. It really is practical. I think sometimes in an attempt to be right or in an attempt to be Christian, we read our Bibles, but we're not actually reading them. So before you read your Bible or before you open your Bible, open your heart. But the first point is read it. And I really mean read it. Like, take it off your shelf, find it wherever it's been, and read it. The only time, that it, we, it's not good enough, or it's not okay for your own spiritual journey, that the only time you're hearing the word is on a Sunday. 
You need to take the Bible and read it. In fact, the scriptures present the idea that the Bible is like our daily bread. It's our sustenance. It's our fresh manna. Some of you are living on stale spiritual manna that you got last Sunday, and you're wanting it to penetrate into your family and into your workspace, and God's like, but I got daily bread for you. You gotta read it daily. And when I say read it, I don't mean skim it, or scan it, or read it when your mind turns off. I literally this morning was reading through the book of John, in the first chapter, like I was taking it in, I was devouring it. The next chapter, something came into my mind. I read the entire chapter. Can't tell you what I read. Anybody else? But then I got to make a decision. I don't skim it and scan it. I study it. I got to study the Bible. The scriptures actually say that we got to look intently into the scriptures. And so I don't know what that looks like for you. For me, sometimes what that means is I just got to do it slowly. I just got to slow down. I don't have to read the whole Bible in, in, in a year if that's, you know, you can do that. But for me, it's more important. There's a great saying that says, don't try and conquer the Bible. Let the Bible conquer you. And sometimes in our attempt to read our three chapters or to read the book or to read the Bible in a year, we read the Bible, but we don't let the Bible read us. And so for me, I just need to slow down. Sometimes, in some seasons, when it's really difficult for my mind, I'm going to say it out loud. I actually have to read the Bible out loud. Sometimes, I've got to do it on repeat. I've just got to be honest with myself. I just read John chapter 5, and I never actually read it. So back we go and read through John chapter 5 again. The first thing is read it. And let me just stop here, friends, and say that the next three R's, are, they make no difference to your life. And so if you're not going to read it, we may as well not continue. You're welcome to leave. But if you choose to read it, then the next three R's are how we should read it. And so the first <coughs> point or second R is review it, which means to go over it multiple times. Think about it. Ponder on it. The Bible uses the word meditate, which a great imagery that I learned at college is the idea of how a cow eats grass, how it chews on the cud. It takes the grass, it chews on it, chews, chews, and then swallows, and then it vomits that back up into its mouth, chews again, gets more nutrients, swallows, vomits it up again until it gets all the nutrients out of it. And I want to tell you that for many of us, we need to take that approach with the word. God, there's so, your word is alive, it's active, it's got so much to give me. It is not text on a page. And so God, I'm going to chew on your word. Psalm 119 verse 97 says it like this. It says, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Eastern religion would tell you that meditation is to clear your mind. But scriptural meditation means that we fill our minds. We're going to fill it with the Word of God. You've got to make sure that you're meditating over and over and over and over and over. Those of you that battle with fear, my little daughter, probably for a fair chunk of the next bit of her life, she's going to have to go. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, God has not made me afraid, but He's given me power, love, and a good mind. God has not made me afraid, but He's given me power, love, and a good mind. He, she's going to have to say that over on repeat, over and over and over and over until it gets into her mind. But church, once it gets in your mind, the scriptures say, as a man thinketh, so he is. If you think Fearfully, you'll be fearful. If you think insecurities, you'll be insecure. If you think depression, you'll be depressed. But if you start to put the Word of God into your mind, you hold on. You go, no, I'm, I'm going I'm to review, I'm going to meditate, I'm going to all day, I'm going to put that over and on repeat. It's not about clearing your mind, it's about filling your mind. That's why Romans chapter 12 says that we are transformed. You are changed. I am changed by the renewing of my mind. And the only way your mind and my mind gets renewed is through the scriptures. Do you know that some of your freedom, some of your success, some of your prosperity, some of your breakthrough is sitting on your, wherever you keep your Bible. 
in your library shelf? What a disaster. No heavy. But like what a disaster that it's sitting on your bookshelf when it's meant to be in here. And when we get it in here, then we start to operate at a level of freedom. All right. Psalm verse 1, 2 to 3 says it like that. But those says it like this. But those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditate on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. I think for all of us, we're going, God, I would love to prosper my family, my business, my health. I would love to not wither, to be weary, to be tired, to be anxious, to be stressed, to be fearful. God, I'd love my life not to wither. And God, I'd love to produce fruit in each season. Well then, friends, we must take the scriptures seriously. Those who delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it day and night, there's your prosperity, there's your breakthrough, there's your freedom, there's your fruit, there's your no withering. Can I read you one more? I'm going to read it anyways, even if you said no. It says this, John, uh, Joshua chapter 1 verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Man, we live in a world, even Christians, who are afraid, who are anxious, who are fearful, who are timid, who are unsure, who are full of doubt, who are the insecurities. But God says, be strong and very courageous, and then maps out how you can be strong and very courageous. Listen to what it goes on to say. Joshua chapter 1 verse 7 goes on and says it like this. It says, be careful to obey all of the law my servant Moses gave to you. Obey, not just listen, we'll speak about that in a moment, but obey all that my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn to the right or to the left so that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. We've spoken a lot throughout this series about putting it in your heart and getting it in your mind. But many of us need to transition now to having it on our lips. See, you can't quote 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 unless it's got into your heart and into your mind. But once it has, it needs to get onto your lips. Many of us need to start to pray it, prophesy it, declare it. When all of a sudden you start to go, Oof. you wake up and you're feeling like, yo, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. Is it going to work? Have, you know, am I enough? For us personally, we've been on this incredible journey of taking a step of faith and trying something new, and I can't tell you how many thoughts we are bombarded with. I know what the enemy's trying to do. He's trying to get into my mind. So I'm going to make sure that my mind is full with the Word of God so there's no space for him. Some of you got an empty mind which allows the enemy to have a full go. But when I feel this sense of like, freak, How's it all going to work out? And I don't know if it's going to work out. Or I'll wake up at two o'clock in the morning. Or somebody asks me a question that I don't have an answer to. Or somebody makes an observation that I already know. And I'm going, oh, and I go, you know what? I just, God, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside quiet waters to restore my soul for your name's sake, God. And even though I walk... If I walk, I walk. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for your rod and staff, they comfort me. And, by the way, devil, he prepares, God prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life as I choose with my family to put our lives in the house of God forever. And I tell you, by the time I'm finished quoting that on my lips, fear Anxiety, worry has disappeared because fear, anxiety, depression can't stay in the presence of the Word. We've got to move. So we don't just need to read it or review it. We need to repeat it. Over and practically, some of you are going to need to go home and take a scripture. Take it for the next month if you need. And write it down. Put it on your steering wheel. Put it on your mirror. Put, put it wherever you find yourself having time to be able to repeat over and over and over. Some of you need to be driving in your car and just quoting scripture. Over. And you, I know. You're like, whoa, what are people going to think? Friend, they already think you're nuts. <laughs> Let's just go. 
I only got the word to hold on to. We're going to hold on to the word. We're going we're gonna to repeat it over and over and over. The scripture goes on in Joshua. It said, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be success, sorry, so, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be pros- prosperous and successful. We need to read it. We need to review it. We need to repeat it. And then number three, we need to reflect on it. We need to reflect on it. The book of James makes a case that the Holy Bible is like a mirror, that it reflects certain things. And we're going to unpack some of the book of James about how to reflect on the Word of God. Do you know they say the average person spends 30 minutes a day looking into the mirror? Some of you boost up the national average. (laughs) See ya. They reckon people find eight different occasions to find their reflection. In the oven, in the side mirror. (laughs) Just the other day, my little guy, Roman, you saw him on the screen, he's four. He's having a bath, all three of them in the bath, and um, he stands up and he says, "I'm, I'm getting out. I'm like, no, you're not. He's like, I am. I'm like, my boy, you have not washed everywhere. He's like, I have. I'm like, my boy, have you washed your face? Dad, I have washed my face. I'm like, I know you're lying. <laughs> so he's like, I, I have. I'm like, do you know what it means to wash your face, Roman Judah? It means taking soap and water and washing your face so that there's no more dirt. Because dad, I have, I have, I have. I'm like, okay, I'm done with this kid. I pick him up. <laughs> Take him to the mirror. He looks in the mirror. He looks at me, he goes, I haven't. (laughs) Brown sand all over his face. (laughs) Friend, when it comes to the Word of God, we have to allow the Word to reflect what's happening on the inside. We have to allow the Word to confront us I'll just be honest, like this oversensitized generation that is being raised, it worries me. It's like, oh no, my, my mental health. Friend, your mental health is gonna get saved when you open the word of God, you let it look into you, and you allow the freedom of Christ to get into your heart. But we gotta allow it to confront us. We gotta look into the word of God. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you and say, your pride, your arrogance, your ego, your impurity, that you continue to go in even though you know it's not right, your jealousy, your gossip that you've written off as it doesn't really matter, but I've said it really matters. We gotta let the word confront us. We, We gotta be clear. The Word of God loves you enough. The Bible, Jesus loves you enough to not leave you as you are, friend. You will be destructive to yourself and to your community if you don't let the Word of God get into you and go, you know what, friend? You cannot live with that unforgiveness. I know they hurt you, but I've told you to forgive them. In fact, I told you if you don't forgive them, then the forgiveness that I've given you stands on murky ground. The offense, the bitterness, the anger, the rage. Our friend, here is your freedom found in the Word of God. That's why I love Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. When I ran youth ministry here, we called our our youth ministry 412 based off of this scripture and a couple of other 412s. But it says this, the Word of God is living and active. Don't mess with it. It'll get you in places you don't always want to be got. The Word of God, it's living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It will pierce between your soul and your spirit. you know what that means? All the soul, fleshly things that try to raise high arguments and say it's okay, the Spirit of God will speak to you and go, no, that's fleshly. That's the Spirit of God. 
It'll divide soul and spirit, bone and marrow. It'll begin to judge the very thoughts and intentions of a man's heart. Friend, you can't escape the Word. You, you can't lie to the Word. You can't fake to the Word because it's Jesus. He knows. He wants you free. He wants you delivered. He wants you whole. But it's got to confront you. We can fake it with our friends. We can fake it with our church. We can put our blessed holy Sundays on. But when you open up the Word, it's you and Him. And He will conquer you if you let Him. Don't leave that Bible on your shelf. Don't leave it in your, in your library. Sorry, I normally get that a little better. It's because I was looking in the mirror. Let me have a... We've got to reflect on it. James chapter 1, verse 21 to 25, speaking about this reflection, speaking about the mirror, says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. It's okay. God, there's stuff on the inside of me. It's gunk. And your Holy Spirit's not going to be able to pour through me if that gunk's in the way. I don't care how old you are or young you are. All of us have gunk. The evil that the Scripture speaks about, the moral filth, we need the Scripture to confront us. Listen to what it says. And humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Just by the way, friends, if the word's not in you, it can't save you. It didn't say, humbly accept the word that's sitting in your Bible. It said, humbly accept the word that's sitting in you. Not in your pastor, in you. Scriptures go on in verse 22 and it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Nike owes royalties to James. Because he said, just do it. Seriously, you've got to do it. You can't just listen to it. I never forget um, when I first got saved. I, man, I fell so hardly in love and passionately in love with Jesus and I just started to devour God's word. Like every time I had a gap, I would read God's word and I just saw it come alive in ways and scriptures I had read before that I hadn't seen stuff. All of a sudden, I was like, wow. And I would read, I would read in the morning and read at night and I was at university, so maybe I had a little more time than some of you, but I was just devouring the word and I was learning it and I heard that I need to meditate. And so I started to like learn scriptures off by heart and I could say John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whomsoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life I'd be able to quote and say 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says God has not given us a spirit of timidity a, a spirit of fear but one of power love and a sound mind and I could go and, and I remember quoting over and over and over Pro I probably honestly quoted somewhere between 50 and 100 scriptures to God I, mean, I was on cloud now and hey, I was like Whoo! God you must be so proud <laughs> and I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit goes nice one which one do you do God is uninterested in what you know about the Bible. What he's interested in is your obedience to the Bible. If you listen on a Sunday and go, that's nice, and don't apply it, God says you deceive yourself. We have to apply the Word of God. Verse 23, and here's where we get to the mirror illustration. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks <coughs> at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. Listen to this next verse. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law. There's the point we were speaking about earlier. You can't just read it or scan it or skim it. You have to study it. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law, into the Word of God that gives freedom and continues in it. That continue means it's a daily habit. It's not something you do on a Sunday or something you do once off, but somebody who intently studies the Scriptures, looks into this perfect law and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. They will be blessed in what they do. So I want to, the, the first reflection it's clear. We look and God goes, oh my, you go, I need to figure out there's a confrontation of you and what God wants to change in you. But there's two other reflections 
when you begin to look intently into the perfect law of God. And when you do that, there's great freedom is what the scripture says. When you begin to look into the perfect law of God, you see Christ and you see who you are in Christ. You see, Jesus is never going to leave you with a whole bunch of, hey, you need to sort out that mess, you need to change that, you can't keep doing that. He does that as a step one. He does that as a, I'm going to help clean you up, not on your own, with the grace of God and the Holy Spirit. But then God says, as, or maybe even more importantly, I want you to see who I am. I want you to see who Jesus is. I need to spend time studying the scriptures to find out who Jesus is because somehow in my mind, I end up having a warped view of who my father is. I can see that when we take our kids to the doctor, they're a little bit sick and we, we feel like we got to take them to the doctor. There's tears. They don't want to go to the doctor. And then we'll kind of cuddle up next to them and say, hey, the doctor's so kind and he's so nice and he's really going to help you and he's not going to do anything to harm you. But you've got to be brave enough to come to him because unless you come to him, he can't help you. And I think much of the time, that's our view of God. We think, because the world's allowed us to think, that God is disappointed. God's angry. God's mad at you because of your sin, because you haven't read your Bible, because of what you did yesterday. We got this warped view of who God is. But when we open up the Scriptures, we see that the Scriptures speak about God. And they say that He is kind that he is slow to anger and abounding in love. We see that he says you're not forgotten. We see that he, he shares about his graciousness, that he's forgiven your, your sins and tossed them as far as the east is from the west. Some of you need to just read the Bible simply to find out who Jesus is. And when you find out, friend, who Jesus is, the second reflection, you begin to see this, the third reflection. And that is who you are in Christ. The world has a way of telling you. See, we're meant to look into the mirror of the word. Much of us is looking into the, into the mirror of the world. And the world has dinged you up. It's told you a whole bunch of things. And because the word hasn't been in your mind, you've believed it. You believe that you're not good enough. You believe that you're not going to make it. You believe that your marriage is finished. You believe that you don't have what it takes. Some of you have just heard over and over, you dumb. You ugly. Some of you might not say it, but you're good for nothing. Nobody likes you. And then God, as we begin to reflect, he starts to write on the tablets of our heart. I know that's what the wor world says, but the word says that you are loved. Some of you have been struggling with addiction for so long. It's become your identity. You feel like you're never going to break free. And Jesus says, I'll bring you freedom. I'll set you free. And you begin to look at the Word, and it gets into your heart and into your mind, and then you declare, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Some of you go, I just feel so rejected and alone and lonely and depressed, and God says, I want you to know first and foremost that you are mine, that I don't reject you, that you are loved. Some of you struggled so long, whether it's physical sickness, whether it's in your mind, your body, and God says, I, I want you to know that you are healed. And he speaks over and over to say that you are whole and that you are the apple of his eye. And he begins to say, I know what the world has said, but would you reflect on what the word has said about you? It's not just a reflection on how we need a change, but it's a reflection 
on who Jesus is and who he's made us to be. You know, Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. A Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. Man, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in medication and help and, and counseling. I, I really am. I think sometimes the church has done a bit of injustice in that space. But I'm not a believer in that over this. In fact, I believe this is, this is your greatest medication. This is your greatest counseling. This is your greatest help. And some of us want to go to a quick fix or find, and I think it's additional help. It's great help. You should seek it. But I'm telling you, some of you are going to find your freedom right here. Some of you are going to find your story. Some of you are going to find your victory right here. You just got to be willing to do the hard yards. The fourth and final R is that once we've read it and reviewed it and reflected on it, we got to reveal it. You are a walking Bible. Maybe the only Bible that someone ever reads. You may be the only Jesus that anybody ever sees. And when we do it, when we apply the Word, when we live the Word, people see Jesus through your life. It's absurd to the world to forgive your enemy, but they'll see Jesus. It's mental to give away so generously, but they'll see Jesus. When we begin to live the Word, we reveal it. Pop up that final scripture. It says this, uh, this one, 1 Peter chapter 1, sorry, verse 23 to 25, it says, for you have been born again. That means you've been saved. Not by perishable seed. Perishable meaning that it'll kind of fade or die. Not by perishable seed, but by imperishable, but of the imperishable through the living and enduring word. Our salvation, our hope, is in a word that isn't falling apart, it isn't fickle, it won't fade. Listen to what it goes on to say. It says, for all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And if you've ever heard people go, well, the Bible is a little outdated. It's not very relevant for these times, friend. It's the only thing that's relevant for these times. Everything else fails. Everything else falls apart. The Word, it's timeless. It endures. It stands. It's always right. And you know, when we begin to do that for people who are falling and failing and breaking around us, they look and they see Jesus. A lost, broken world. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. That's what it looks like to be a Christian. Those who read it, review it, repeat it, do it, reflect on it, allow the identity to be reshaped, and then reveal it to the world. So, the question, I guess, is begged to be asked. At the end of a four-week Holy Bible series, are you reading your Bible? There's no other way to say it. Now, at the risk of losing some friends, let me say this. There's a quote. Um, is it Moody who says it? You pop that quote up. The Bible will keep you from sin. We've spoken about that. And sin will keep you from the Bible. Leave that quote up. Some of you are like, well, I'm not, not reading my Bible because of sin. No, you are, friend. I'll tell you why. Because pride is the root of all sin. And as long as you don't think you need the Word, as long as you don't hold it in high value, as long as you have not chosen that you will seek first the kingdom of God, that the word will be priority in your life, then pride exists and sin is running rampant. 
And I believe that if you've sat here for four weeks and gone, that's nice, but haven't made a decision to read your Bible, for me, it's called a spade a spade. Start to smell a little bit like arrogance. Not because I'm telling you, because Hilt's telling you, your church is telling you, but because God Himself has given us the best gift on this side of eternity. He said, it's my very breath. And you and I need to make a decision to go, I hold the Word of God in high regard. My family are going to gather around it. My life is going to gather around it. If possible, my business is going to gather around it. But this Word, it will be front and center. It's a holy Bible. It's no ordinary textbook. It has the ability to change your life and the world around you. So I strongly encourage you, if you've enjoyed this series, fantastic. But you've got to implement the Word of God. Otherwise, you just deceive yourself. So today's the day. Do not say you're going to read your Bible tomorrow. You actually have to go home and read your Bible today. You're like, no, Carl, but I've been in church. I know, friend. I've just seen how this has gone. Tomorrow never comes. I'll read my Bible today. I'll seek you first today. I'm going to choose to honor the Word of God today. And then figure out a way that you get the Word of God into your heart on a daily basis going forward. Can I pray for you? Father, thank you. Thank you for the immense privilege of your word. Really, God, it's, it's, it's my prayer. You've heard my prayer already this morning to you. And no one would feel condemned or guilty here, but that there would be a fear and a reverence of you and your word in this place. That, God, you say very clearly that we work out our salvation in fear and trembling. That's not to be afraid, but that's in high regard and high honor to go, you're holy. And so, God, I thank you. I really believe there are many decisions that are happening in this, in this room right now. And, okay, God, that's it. You've arrested my heart, and I'm choosing you, God. I'm choosing your word. So thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in people's hearts and for the honor of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Adele.